Hi, I'm Mark Priestley. After a life spent in the elite environment of the Formula One pit lane learning how to win, this podcast aims to bring that elusive high-performance culture into your daily lives. In this week's episode, we're looking at the small things you can do for people around you to improve their performance that might inadvertently improve your own performance further down the line. Plus, two words that are often forgotten that can become a game changer if you use them at the right moment. Welcome back to Pit Lane Life Lessons. Talk about how Formula One teams are so successful. Tiny things, but you only find those tiny things when you look for them. Of course, there's only one winner in every Grand Prix, so for everybody else, you haven't won, so it could be deemed that that's, that's a failure. Hey everybody and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Pit Lane Life Lessons podcast. As ever, thank you so much for tuning in, for listening, wherever it is you are in the world, however you're listening and whatever it is you're up to whilst listening. I know that people listen to this podcast whilst out for a run or in the gym, but whilst driving a car, as I listen to most of my podcasts, whatever it is you're doing, walking the dogs, cleaning your house, it doesn't matter. I appreciate you all. Thank you for taking the time and spending some of your precious time with me. Um, I've got to say a big thank you as ever to Car Gods for sponsoring this episode again, as they've done all the way through season five. Um, a big, big help to me and to this podcast. Car Gods are really supporting me and giving me total freedom to do and say whatever I want. And that's the beauty of this relationship that I've got with Car Gods. They're not giving me some script which they want me to read out to promote their products. I'm promoting their products and I've got this partnership with them because I 100% believe in their products. I've used them for long, long, long before we ever became a partnership together. And I know that they're the best thing out there and that's why I wanted to join up with them and that's why whatever I say about them and about their products and the team behind the products comes from the heart. It's genuine, believe me. More about them later on, but thank you to Car Gods. Check out cargods.com for any of your car detailing and car care needs. That's what I'll leave it as for now. We'll come back to it later. Um, this week, I want to talk about a couple of things, notably, and I'm gonna start with a subject that is very, very fresh to me. I have spent today, I'm recording this on Saturday night, I spent the day in Bratislava in Slovakia where I was brought over here to help promote my book that's recently been translated into Slovak and also into Czech. But today they put on this event at a bookstore that's just been opened in a shopping center here in Bratislava and they asked me to come along and to meet the crowds, to sign some autographs, have a bit of an interview on stage in front of people, and just generally promote the book. And in the build up to this, I don't know how many people are gonna turn up, if anyone's gonna turn up, and nobody does. The people who've put on the event have no idea. It's a big unknown. And this was the same when I promoted the book back in England when I first launched it. You have absolutely no idea. You go to some bookstores, there's an enormous crowd, at others, there's almost nobody there. It's almost unpredictable. And Slovakia is a very small country with a small population. They have no history of Formula One. There's no historic Formula One drivers. There's no Formula One track, but it's got a growing Formula One fan base as many places around the world have. And so they asked me to come out here and I was a tiny bit nervous, I'll be honest, about accepting that invitation because whilst of course I wanna promote the book, I also, I thought about Slovakia and I thought nobody's gonna be following Formula One in Slovakia. I'm gonna turn up and it might be almost embarrassing when I turn up and no fans turn up, nobody's gonna be here. Anyway, I arrived on Friday morning. Uh, I was greeted at the airport by uh, the publishers who've translated the book into Slovak. They met me at the airport. The guy who runs the publishing company came and met me personally, he picked me up. He basically took care of all of my needs. He looked after me incredibly well. He drove me from the airport to my hotel where he had already prepared an incredible room. In fact, it's the room that I'm sitting in right now. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see it in the background. You may have seen on Instagram that when I walked into my hotel room, there was, as a welcome gift, there was a cake in my room decorated to look like my book. It had 
the front cover design of my book on the top of the cake. It was an amazing thing to walk into the room to. Now, all of this stuff had been arranged in advance of me getting here. Every one of my needs has been looked after and taken care of. The guys, these guys from the publishing team, the, the, the owner of the publishing company, along with his wife, came and picked me up in his car. They took me to the press event that we had on Friday. Again, all the time making sure that I was okay and well looked after, bringing me drinks, making sure that if I needed a break, I got one. They managed the, the crowd of journalists that was there on Friday afternoon for the press event. And on Friday evening, I accepted an invitation to go for dinner with him and his wife, uh, who took me out in the evening and showed me a little bit of Bratislava, some of the local experiences to try some traditional Slovakian food and uh, an evening of entertainment. And basically, they just looked after me so, so well. The day came today where we had the public events, and this was the one where I wasn't sure what was going to happen. When we got there this morning or this afternoon, my colleagues, my publishing colleagues uh, from the publishing company, again, picked me up personally, took me to the event, and they had make sure that every single box had been ticked in terms of preparation. Preparation in case nobody turns up to make sure that I felt okay and was well looked after in that kind of situation. But also they made every preparation in case some people turned up, but also if too many people turned up. They'd covered every single area. And because I'd been so well looked after and all of my needs had been met and they'd given me this lovely personal touch, they had listened to my podcast, many of the episodes of the podcast, they'd obviously read my book, they have followed me on Instagram and on Twitter and they knew a huge amount about me before I got here. And because of that, they were able to tune in this very personal experience for me, knowing some of the things I like, some of the things I don't like. They knew already, for example, that I don't eat meat. And so when we went to a restaurant, that was already catered for. And it was an incredible level of attention to detail to make sure that I was okay. Now, that was obviously lovely on so many levels. It was lovely because it was a nice thing to have somebody running around looking after you to that degree. And I really appreciate it. But the other really big advantage or big difference that that made was it made me feel like I was willing to go to greater lengths to support them in putting on this event. And let me explain what I mean. Last night, when I was here after the press event, the guys from the publishing team had got a brand new stack of autograph cards printed. There were hundreds and hundreds of them. I think there were around 300 cards that were still cellophane wrapped in this big bundle. They'd just come off the press. And the guy said to me, listen, I've got this big stack of cards here. He said, obviously, don't, you don't need to sign them all, but I've got them in case the queues happen to be so long tomorrow that not everybody can get in to see the actual interview on the stage. And so what I thought was, if you don't mind signing some of them, the people that are stuck outside, if there's a queue, I could go around giving some of these to the people in that queue to try and make them feel a little bit better about not being on the inside of the bookstore because they have a limit in the, uh, the capacity that can come in. And I thought, oh, that's a lovely touch. That's a lovely idea that you've thought about that level of detail. You've thought about the people that might be a bit disappointed if they've got there and they can't actually get in because the store's full. And so he gave me this big stack of cards. He said, look, if you sign five of them or 10 of them or 20, whatever you feel comfortable doing, if you get a moment this evening, would you mind just signing a few? Because it might really help me out tomorrow. And what I did when I got back to the hotel last night after a, an evening out and dinner with this great big stack of cards, I started signing a few of them. And I thought, look, I'll do 20 or 30. I'll just keep going and, until I get kind of tired uh, and I need to go to bed. And actually what I thought was, because of the way that I'd been looked after during the day, I had this subconscious thought. There was nothing conscious about it, but there was a subconscious feeling on my part that they'd gone to such great lengths to look after me and to make sure that I was well cared for and catered for, that the very least I could do is give something back and give a little bit of my time to make sure that they could put on the best event they could do. And so I sat there and I signed every single one of the cards, 300 cards. I sat and signed over the course of last night, Friday night, 
and this morning, Saturday morning. It probably took me hours, I can't remember how long, but I did it whilst I was speaking on the phone, whilst I was watching a bit of television. Uh, I did all sorts of things while I was doing, while I was eating my dinner or eating my breakfast, I signed more cards. But I just kept going and I was determined that I would sign the entire stack of cards because if they needed them today at the event, then there would be something there for all of those people that had turned up. And I was putting in that extra effort to make sure that I could give everybody one of those cards because the people had looked after me to such great lengths. They'd gone to such great lengths to make sure that I felt good and I was comfortable. And this idea of reciprocation really dawned on me. I was willing to go to greater lengths because they had already gone to great lengths to look after me. When I got to the event this afternoon, it was the most incredible event. I'm still buzzing with adrenaline right now because around 700 people turned up to this small little bookstore in a shopping center here in Bratislava. The bookstore has an absolute capacity limit of 350 people. And the queue outside the bookstore was stretching along the the corridors of of the shopping center and round the corner, and it stayed that way almost all afternoon. Now I was kind of booked in to be there for around about an hour signing autographs. But the same thing came over me when I got to the end of that hour and the queue was still incredibly long. People came to me and said, look, the queue, you know, we've done an hour. You've done hundreds of people, hundreds of autographs, but we've done an hour. That's what we said we'd do. And I looked up and I saw the queue was still so long. And I thought, no, we're going to get through all of these people. And so I stayed for almost three hours, constantly signing autographs, taking pictures, meeting people and thanking people for coming. People were buying my book and bringing it to me and saying such lovely things. There was no way I wanted to let them down. And the reason that I didn't want to let them down that I didn't want to let this event down or the bookstore or the publishing house was because they had looked after me so well. And the point I'm trying to make with all of this is that when we look after people, when we go to a little bit of extra attention to detail on the people around us, those people are willing to give more attention to detail into the thing that we're asking them to do. Now, it might seem obvious. It might seem like a natural thing to do. But in reality, when we're talking about extra performance, high performance in either a an individual type case, our personal lives, or whether we're talking about a corporation, a big business, whether we're talking about a Formula One team, these same things apply. There was no conscious decision from me today to uh, reciprocate the, the kindness that they'd given me. It was a subconscious thing. It just happened. I just signed all of those cards without really thinking about it. But there was something driving me to do that, and it was because there had been some care and attention lavished on me beforehand. Now, the theory behind all of this might seem pretty clear, it might seem pretty obvious. If you think about a Formula One team, we do exactly the same thing with a, a Formula One driver. There is a massive amount of care and efforts in every Formula One team to give the driver everything he needs. The job of a Formula One mechanic and engineers is as much as it is to build the cars and to assemble them and make sure they're operating the right way, it's to take any stress away from the drivers as much as possible. It's to make sure that they have everything they need. They're as comfortable as they can be inside the car, that they don't need to worry about anything other than their job. The bit they should be focusing on is just the driving and we try and take away every other part, every other concern they might have. Any question they might have, we try and answer it before they have to even ask the question. It's that care and attention that enables the driver to do the best job they can do, to give all of their mental and physical capacity into focusing on the job in hand, driving that Formula One car as fast as possible. Same thing as applied to me this weekend. The team behind this event took everything away from me other than allowing me or enabling me to turn up at this event and be on the best form possible for all of these people who'd put in the time and effort to come along and say hello. 
For every one of those hundreds of people who turned up today, I hope that I gave them a great big smile, that I greeted them with the same level of enthusiasm for the 750th person that I did with the very first person that turned up earlier on today. That was only possible because I was so well looked after. The hotel room was incredible. I was given one of the nicest hotel rooms in the city. I had a comfortable bed. The hotel staff rushed around to make sure that I was absolutely well looked after. I was cared for. I had no worries, no concerns. I slept well, I ate a lovely breakfast, I had people running around checking I was okay all day long. And so I was as refreshed as I could be. I was able to turn up and give my all to the people that had come to this event, give my all to the event. And that was the point of all of this. The care and attention that had gone in behind the scenes paid them back subconsciously, by the way, paid them back as the event unfolded. And the event was better for it. I was better. I performed at a higher level at this event because of what had been lavished on me over the course of the weekend. And that's not to say that I am some sort of diva and I need the luxury side of life. I don't. It's nothing to do with that but it's just about people asking if I was okay, checking in with me to make sure that I had the things that I needed, asking if I wanted a little break. Do I need a drink? Do I want something to eat? Do I need a bit more space? Is there anything at all that I needed? And because people were willing to ask me those questions, if I did need something, I could ask. I didn't have to start wondering where the person was, who I should ask about this, whether I should bring something up that I needed. There was no question of it because somebody had come to me and asked me first. It was an easy thing for me to go and do. And so I performed at a higher level. Now, when I go back to this Formula One example of how Formula One treats the drivers, that's something that Formula One teams have always done. I think Formula One as a whole has always looked after the drivers and treated them like the stars of the show that they are. We did that not just because they were the stars of the show, but because teams appreciated that to get the best out of them, we needed to do just that, to take as much of the stress away, to allow them to be calm and relaxed and focused on the job in hand. But that's really a theory that shouldn't and does now not only apply to Formula One drivers. In a Formula One team, the exa- exactly the same philosophy can be applied to all of those people within the team. Whether you're a mechanic or an engineer or a truck driver or whether you work in the design office, if the team and the company is willing and able to lavish a little bit more care and attention onto those people, all of the staff of the organisation, the same things will apply. You will get a little bit more out of them. You'll get a better product out of those people. They will be easily or more easily able to focus on their job. They'll be more willing to go above and beyond the call of duty when you need them to. That's what happened for me today. There was no question of me stopping after an hour of meeting these people. There was no question of me signing five or 10 of those autograph cards. In my mind, the very least I could do was do my very best to make sure that that event went as well as possible and everybody got the experience that the team behind the event wanted them to have. The same thing applies to Formula One teams and their staff, but it applies to every single business out there in the world. Any company who's able to give a bit more care and attention to their staff, to listen to them when they got concerns, to ask them and give them a a conduit for raising those concerns, giving a a person some time to speak to the people in charge, the boss, their boss, or the boss of the company, if you have that opportunity. Giving somebody a sounding board or giving them a voice within a company is massively important and massively productive. Giving somebody the feeling that they're being listened to is huge for productivity. If you look after the team that's behind your organization, the team will look after you in return. And it's not something that's conscious. As I said, it's not something that ever has to be written down. It's not something that's contracted. 
These are the kinds of responses that human beings give other human beings when they feel like those human beings are looking after them. If you feel like somebody cares for you, you are much more willing to care for those people in return. And it's not something that's even just restricted to businesses. Of course, when a company is trying to extract the best out of their people, these are the kind of things that in days gone by were often seen as soft skills, fluffy skills, things that were almost a weakness for many organizations. In the old days of people running an organization, the boss was never seen to be that soft and caring, that kind-hearted. It was seen as being weak sometimes. You had to be brutal and ruthless and you had to be demanding of your staff and you had to get the most out of them almost by beating them with a stick. That's not the case in modern thinking. It's not the case in the modern world. We can't operate like that. If we try and operate like that, and there are still some companies that do, if we operate on that kind of basis, people leave. People complain, people moan, people are feeling down, and they have no desire to go above and beyond when the company needs a little bit more out of them, when there's a crisis going on, when a project just needs to be delivered, but the clock ticks past five o'clock. That might be the time most people go home, but on this particular day, we've just got to get going for another couple of hours to deliver the project that a lot of people are relying on, that the company's relying on. Well, in that moment, if you've looked after those people, they're far more likely to just give you those extra couple of hours and get that project over the line when you need them to. It's all about reciprocating some love and some care. And that's something that's not restricted to businesses and to companies. On a personal level, we do exactly the same with family. Obviously, it's easier to do that and more natural thing to do with families because we have that love. But if, we get, if we're willing to show that love, we get it back, we get it in return. With our children, if we give them attention, if we give them care and attention, they are much more likely to open up to us, to give us the kind of information that we'd love to see from them. Those kind of things that if we don't give them care and attention, if we're sitting there on our phone whilst talking to our children, we're giving off a message that the phone is more important than the child. There is no way that child is going to feel comfortable in opening up and giving you some deep, heartfelt message they really want to get across to you because they don't feel like you're interested. It's about reciprocating the care and attention you want back from somebody else. Give it out in the first place and it's a far easier thing for somebody to bounce back at you. Now in terms of performance, what I've just described to you with today's event is a perfect example of how my performance was elevated because of the way people treated me. And my point here, we talked about kindness last week in last week's episode. Uh, I was pleased to see many of you writing very kind messages on social media and tagging me in them. Thank you for that. What an amazing feeling that is to give a little bit of kindness. It's lovely to receive it, but it's also great to give it. We talked about that all last week. If you haven't heard it, go and check out last week's episode. But the same thing applies here because that kindness and that thoughtfulness can go a long way to improving the performance of you, the people around you, your team, your organization. If you care for your teammates, your teammates will care for you. And when it comes to performance, we're always looking for any sort of margin that we can create, any performance advantage. It's very easy to look at performance advantages and think about how we improve the technical side, how we improve our physical capabilities if we're talking about sports teams. It's uh, about how, what sort of technical ability we can develop, practicing, going over and over again, a routine that we might have. But actually the psychological improvements of performance can be just as significant. In many cases, it can be even bigger than the one that we can achieve through physical improvements. Psychology plays such a massive role in everything that we do. But when you're looking for performance in a competitive world, it's something that's relatively new as a subject to study, as a subject to focus attention on. Many companies and businesses, even sports teams, are still getting to grips with the psychological elements of human performance. Yet it's massive. 
we spent so much time at McLaren understanding this inside the world of Formula One. As I've talked about many times, I was part of that process at McLaren and it only spurred me on to study it even more once I left. So studying psychology and team psychology and sports psychology has been a massive passion of mine in the years since I left the team. And all of that learning has gone into this moment today. It's gone into the things I do in my life today. An understanding of how important that is means I'm now willing to give an extra amount of effort to developing that side of my personality, the mental side. But I also know that me putting effort into developing the psychological state of those people around me can bear fruits for me as well. If I am willing to put some time and effort into improving my teammates' psychological state, my colleagues' psychological state, or my friends and family in the same way, I know their performance is gonna be elevated. And if in some way, like as your colleagues at work, if elevating the psychological performance of those people around you can benefit you or your company, then why wouldn't you put the time and effort that that requires into making it better? Now, when it comes to personal relationships, exactly the same philosophy actually applies. And if I take the example of my wife and I, we've been together for many, many years now, but we're completely different people. We couldn't be more opposite in so many different ways. They say opposites attract, and that's very, very true. Some of the best relationships, either personal relationships, romantic relationships, or relationships in business are often the best when you have two very opposing characters coming together. Because what you do is you can complement each other. And that's what happens with my wife and I. We complement each other's strengths, but we, importantly, we complement each other's weaknesses. I feel like I'm strong in some of the areas where my wife Claire is not so strong. She's definitely strong in some of the areas where I'm weak. And that's why a relationship works so well. But the other thing is, in the areas where I think Claire struggles or suffers, or where the areas where I feel like I struggle sometimes, each of us has now got an understanding after all of these years of what it takes to get the other person to thrive. How we get the best performance out of each other. Whether that is just in our general feelings and happiness, or whether it comes to the way we both work in completely different fields, we both have an understanding now of what each other needs to, to thrive in those environments. And because we know that, because we have an understanding of that, I know, for example, of some of the things that I can do to help Claire to, to really thrive when it comes to her working at home, as we often are these days post-COVID. I know some of the things that can become detrimental to her happiness or to her stress levels, for example. And I know that there are things that I can do to alleviate some of those stresses or some of those things that can create a freedom or an environment in which I know that she will thrive. She will do her best work when I create an environment which will support that. Now, sometimes that might go completely against the way that I need things to be around me. It might go against the way that I would need somebody to react around me to get the same performance or the same results out. But because I know what she needs, I'm able, and if I'm willing to do that, and let's be fair, none of us are always willing to go to these greater lengths. Sometimes I have to do things that I find strange or that I find not uncomfortable, but things that I wouldn't necessarily put the same level of importance on because they're not so important to me, sometimes I have to go to those lengths because I know that will really help Claire. And I'm trying to think of a good example, but a good example might be, you know, a, a great example here, for example, is that I know that when Claire comes into the house, if she sees mess and untidiness the moment she walks through the door, that immediately impacts her happiness state. And if I've impacted, or if that has impacted her happiness state in a negative way, that will impact her mood. And then her mood will impact her performance, whether it comes to work or the way she behaves around the, the children or me. So there's a small thing that I can do. I can make sure that when she comes home from work, 
the first scene that she sees when she opens that door is really kind of tidy and ordered because that gives her a sense of calm. It gives her a sense of happiness when she walks into the door, a feeling of pleasure coming into the home. If she sees chaos and untidiness and clothes lying around or shoes been, not been put away, cushions that are all you know, knocked all over the place, and I get it, she starts to see chaos. And because she sees chaos, her mind goes into chaos and it has this negative spiral. Now that's a, an example, it's a small example. I've made it sound really quite severe, it's not like that. But I know that these small impacts, those little details can have on Claire. For me, the same sort of things. I know that Claire knows that I get stressed if I'm gonna be late. And if we're going out as a group, as a family, I'll be ready very early. Claire is not necessarily the sort of person that has that same philosophy around that as me. She doesn't have a need to be there early. She's quite happy to be there just on time. And if she's a few minutes late, she doesn't worry about it. Whereas I do. So if I'm trying to get ready and I've got the children ready and I'm waiting for Claire, that's gonna stress me out. And it will stress me out all the way in the journey we might be getting in the car and going somewhere. It's gonna to start to bubble away in the back of my mind. If it's bubbling away in the back of my mind that I might be late, I'm not concentrating, I'm not giving attention to the things that I should be giving attention to. And so Claire has learnt how important that is to me. And so she's able to put a little bit more effort into those moments when she sees the very first signs of me starting to get concerned about being late, she'll put some extra effort in to make sure that we're there on time or that we're not late, that she can be a little bit earlier than she would naturally feel like she needs to be. Those are tiny examples, but they're examples of people going to a little bit of extra effort to do things that might not necessarily come naturally to them because they know it will improve the performance or the well-being or the happiness, all of those things, by the way, which have a knock-on effect to performance of the people around them. And that's a really important lesson, I think, that we can all start to learn. Whether it's children, whether it's a, a romantic partner, people in a company, in a business, in a sports team, your friend groups, whatever it is, if there are things that you know people around you need to get the best out of them and you're able to help achieve those things or to deliver those things, it can be a worthwhile effort to go to because eventually that will reciprocate back to you. You will be in need one day of those people around you supporting you in a similar way. And if you've done that, if you've gone to those lengths to help those people, they will be far more likely to give it back. So we're trying to improve the performance of our businesses, of our Formula One teams, for example, these are tiny little details that may be unnatural in many cases. It's not natural for a big organization, for the boss of that organization to go and ask a person sitting at a desk that might be so many ranks below them in the company, it's not a natural thing for that person to go up and ask that, that person how they're doing, if there's anything they need help with. But if you do that, the effect that can have on that person can be astronomical. And of course, if you've got a company of a thousand people, the boss can't go around and see a thousand people every day and ask how they're doing. But they can do it every now and again. And because they do it every now and again, and even if you've only seen one person and asked them how they're doing, giving them a little bit of personal support, let them know you're there for them. Not only have you helped that person, but the people around them that have seen you help that person start to have an understanding that you're the kind of boss that is willing to listen to their concerns. That word spreads amongst the team. And that feeling that comes from that is one of positivity towards you. And that reflects on the organization. And if you get a feeling of positivity around that organization, well, we know that the effects of that can be a, more, a far more positive outcome, a far more productive outcome from the people within the team. People willing to stand up and be counted and give a little bit extra to the company because they know the company has their back. Now, I'm sure we've all worked in organizations where that's not the case. And if that's not the case, the opposite applies. I've been in a situation recently where 
I've been working with a team who are a little bit disgruntled recently about the way the organization treats them. And it's simple things like the team that I'm talking about here have been a little bit upset that when they travel for work, as many of them do, they get put in the cheapest of hotels. And some of those hotels are so cheap and nasty, almost uncomfortable, not clean, not tidy. And it's such a, a difficult thing to ask those people to do who have, your, your business has asked them to, to leave home, to leave their friends and family back home and go away on business for your company. And yet the company is not willing to spend a few extra pounds on putting them into a slightly nicer hotel, making those people feel like they're being looked after. These things are almost a false economy. By saving a few pounds on a horrible, rubbish, dirty, cheap hotel, you get this knock-on effect where over time, the people that you've put in those hotels start to lose confidence in the company. They start to have this opinion that the company is not willing to look after them, so why on earth would we be willing to go to greater lengths when they need us? And in this example that I'm talking about, that same team who were not just complaining about hotels, but complaining about all sorts of things, start uh, team members being questioned around expense claims over a few miles when it comes to their mileage that they're claiming um, uh, expenses on, getting a massively limited budget for their dinner when they go to those hotels or their lunches, getting stopped on the clock for how long they're taking a break during the day. These little tiny details where a company is almost acting like big brother and watching over them to make sure that the people in that team are not gaining anything from the company. In that scenario, those people are so disgruntled now, they have such low confidence in the company and the team that they're working for, when it does come to them needing to be asked to do a little bit extra, they're just not willing to do it. They will clock off at five o'clock and go home when the project's not quite finished. And when the boss comes along and says, look guys, I need you to stay for an extra hour, they're less likely to be willing to do that. So this false economy of spending a little bit less money on a hotel or not looking after your people by giving them a little bit of extra time for a break, by not watching over them constantly. If they make a personal phone call during the day, don't pull them up on it. I mean, if it happens all the time and they're using so much of their company time for personal stuff, of course that's different. But the odd phone call, which we all need to make when there's a drama going on back home, we need to phone the doctor and make an appointment. Let those things go. It seems so simple to do, and yet so many companies watch over these people like a big brother type scenario. It's counterproductive. And it has this really significant knock-on effect to the people within that team. And I'm seeing it with one particular team that I'm working with. And it's having a really negative effect on those people. They're complaining constantly about the company. They roll their eyes when another decision comes from head office. They all get together and they complain. They talk in a negative sense around the people they're working for. And when you have people talking in a negative sense about your organization, you are never going to get the best out of those people. So putting the time and attention and giving the people in your team, the people around you, a little bit of love, putting a bit of extra effort into trying to find out what it is they need to thrive and then delivering that for them. That can be so effective in getting those people to deliver more for you to delivering their very best performance, whether it's at work or in any scenario in life. If you wanna get the best out of people, you have to give an individual approach the best you can. You can't do that for every single person in an enormous organization, but giving the feeling of having an individual approach, whether it's individual on the small teams within that company, giving a little bit of time and attention to listen to their concerns, to listen to their ideas for improvement, but then acting on those ideas, making those ideas a reality. Those little things have a massive effect on the psychology of the people within that organization. And as we've talked about so many times, a more positive psychological state is a great way to get better performance out of all of those people that will then affect 
the bottom line of your organization. So have a think about that. Have a think about the people around you in your immediate circle, whether it's in your personal life or in your business life. Is there something you can do? Is there a question you can ask the people around you? Do they need something? Do they need a bit of help? Do they need a bit of time or a bit of space? Is there anything you can do to support them? Because there might just be a day when you need their support and they're far more likely to give it if you've been thinking along those lines in the first place. Now, when it comes to achieving maximum performance in any walk of life, not only do you need to be in the right headspace, not only do you need to have the right people and the right environment around you, those people looking after you to enable you to have maximum performance, but you also need to have the right tools and the right equipment. In my role as a mechanic, the right tools are essential. The right tool for the job makes the job so much easier to do as well as everything I've just talked about around the psychological state that you're in. You have to have all of those elements. You've got to be physically in the right place, mentally in the right place, and then you've got to have the right tools available to do the job. Otherwise, it becomes a struggle. How many times have we tried to do a job on a car at home or a DIY job, but not had the right tool? And it just becomes an absolute nightmare because the job's harder than it should be. So when it comes to having the right tools in place, of course, it's critical for a mechanic or for somebody in that position where you're doing a jobs with your hand, physical work. Now, I'm bringing this up because Car Gods, my sponsor for this particular episode, Car Gods Detailing, whilst they not necessarily they're a big tool manufacturer, they do provide a tool for me in my role as a mechanic, particularly when it comes to filming wheeler dealers. They provide the tools and products that make my job so much easier. And the reason I wanted to talk about it was this week, I had a car through the workshop that was essentially a barn find. Now, I can't tell you too much about it. I've dropped a little hint on Instagram uh, recently. It's a great car and I cannot wait for you to see it. But it was in a right state. It's a barn find. So it's been sat in a sort of uh, a field or in a barn, literally in a barn, for years, and that means it's covered in all sorts of moss and dirt and grime. And this week, I used one of the Car God's products to tackle this car that was quite daunting. It was in such a disgusting state, quite frankly. I turned to some of the Car God's products, and the one that really stood out, I used their Wheel Perfection Spray, Wheel Perfection Cleaner, it's called, and it's literally a spray. I sprayed it onto the wheels of this car, which are so horribly dirty. I was kind of worried about tackling them, how much work it was gonna be to get them clean, whether I'd ever get them clean, or whether they were permanently stained. I sprayed the Wheel Perfection Cleaner all over it and then left it and I actually walked off. And I went and got a cup of tea, got in some conversations. And when I came back, having not done anything to them other than spray this stuff on, they were almost clean again. And it was quite remarkable. And it really opened my eyes to what having the right tool or the right product can do for you. It took so much of the effort out of that job for me. And so the Car God's Wheel Perfection Cleaner is something that I cannot recommend enough. If you've got alloy wheels or if you've got wheels that are in a bit of a state, quite frankly, and they can be caked in brake dust, these were actually covered in moss. There were things growing on them. And this spray did 75, 80% of all of the work just by spraying the product on. And as it gradually ran down and seeped away, it took all of that grime with it, and then a little bit of a clean with a brush, and they're almost back to new again. So I can't recommend it highly enough. Cargo's Wheel Perfection Cleaner is just one of their products that I happen to have used recently, and it blew my mind how good it was. And I think that's kind of representative for so many of their products. So please go and check them out, uh, and I really appreciate their help and support on this podcast. Go and check out cargods.com, and they've got everything that you need to make the jobs on your car a whole load easier. Right, now, uh, this particular episode, I really wanted to cover a topic that was highlighted to me this week when I had lunch with a friend of mine who works very closely, or has been at least working very closely to some extent with Sebastian Vettel. Um, Now, my friend who's working with him has also worked with a number of other very high profile sports stars, superstars, people that you know, mega stars in the world of sport, he's worked with a lot of them. 
And one of the things that struck me this week when I said to him, well, how's it been working with Sebastian? What's been your impression of working with him? He said, oh, he's a great guy. He's amazing. I said, oh, what's, what's so good? He said, he's just a nice guy. He said, he's obviously pretty good at what he does. We know that from his history in the sports, he's a great driver. And we know he's also struggling a little bit right now. It's a difficult season for him. So from a driver that's been used to winning championships, to be in the midfield and struggling at times the way Sebastian is, that could be quite a difficult psychological thing, quite a mentality shift. And we also know that he's in the final year of his, his contract and he's going to retire uh, for the sport for, from the sport for now. But the thing that struck me, well, that my friend said about Sebastian that stood out, was he said, you know, it was amazing. I was working with Sebastian last week and he said, it was incredible because I got to the end of the day and he said, thank you. And I said, yeah. He said, yeah, but he said, thank you. He took the time to say thank you for what I'd done for him. He said, I've been working with him every day for a period of time now. And he says, thank you every single day. And I said, yeah, well, OK, well, that's just politeness. He said, but yeah, but you'd be amazed how many of these superstars in sport and quite frankly, in business, it's the same. And my friend has worked with them as well. He said, it's amazing how many of those people don't do that. They're so busy, they're so focused on certain things that they forget the basics of life, the basics of politeness, manners. He said, you'll be amazed how few people that he works with at these very high levels in business and sports ever actually remember to turn around and say thank you. But Sebastian Vettel, he said, does it every single time. And I'm not that surprised at Sebastian because I know that Sebastian is a very kind guy. I know that the people in his team really appreciate the levels that he goes to to show appreciation for what they do. But the fact that it stood out as being a stark difference was something that, that highlighted a problem with people who get to a very high level in all sorts of walks of life and then forget the basic manners that I'm sure many of them were brought up with and yet have forgotten. For everything I've just said in the first part of this podcast about me being so well looked after this weekend and treated almost like a star, which is an amazing thing for me. It's a massaging my ego all weekend long. It's a lovely experience. It's not something that I'm used to having. I've loved it because my ego loves it. Of course it does. I'm not going to pretend it doesn't. But I haven't forgotten to say thank you to every single person. But I can see how if that happens every single day of your life, if you become a superstar, and I've seen this happen with racing drivers over the years. I've seen it happen with the likes of Lewis Hamilton, for example, and I don't want to criticize Lewis in any way. The problem is not just with the person, but it's with the system that they operate within. If you see a racing driver like Lewis come into the sport as this rookie as he was back in 2007, a young kid who was so enthusiastic about what he was doing, so desperately happy to be there and so appreciative of all the people around him, he then very quickly, over the first six months to a year of that career in Formula One, began losing that focus on appreciating the people in his team. And I've documented this in my book. I've written about it many times. Lewis Hamilton, in the first year of the sport, put so much time and attention into fighting Fernando Alonso, into enjoying the life that he now had, where people did literally everything for him. He had people to do everything on his behalf that he became very quickly quite used to it, quite accustomed to it. He took it for granted to some extent. And the people in his team in 2007 became disgruntled because of that. They saw a driver who was almost using the team in a negative sense by playing games in the media, using the team in his battle against this fight with Fernando Alonso. And don't get me wrong, Fernando Alonso was doing the same thing but it's hard to take from the team's perspective because we've seen this young kid who was so happy and grateful then shift over a relatively short space of time when he got swept along in this absolute Hollywood show that became the Lewis Hamilton story. Now, I'm very pleased to say that over the next year or so through 2008, 
Lewis managed to shift that back again. And he did get this appreciation of the team back. He sort of, I think, uh, understood that he'd lost focus on what was really important. And his focus had shifted to something that was actually becoming detrimental to him and his championship in 2007. But more importantly, it was becoming detrimental to the people around him. In 2008, he came back with Fernando Alonso gone, Lewis came back as a different person. He was being advised differently. He had somebody point out that he wasn't treating the people around him in a way that they deserved and needed to be treated. And something as simple as saying thank you. And there's a little note, a story in my book when I was working as Lewis Hamilton's number one mechanic and Lewis had come to me at the end of a, a, a Grand Prix weekend, the German Grand Prix or the European Grand Prix in Germany, where we'd had an absolute disastrous weekend where Lewis had crashed the car and there was a monumental effort to get that car up and running in time for the race. And Lewis had come to me to say, and this was in 2007, and Lewis had come to me and said, look, thank you so much for all the effort from all of the guys to get the car ready. I really appreciate it. And he said, can you tell the guys that I'm saying thank you? And I said to him, no, Lewis, you tell the guys. I said, it's going to make such a difference if you go and tell the guys personally. We're talking about five or six people. Just spend a moment to go and individually say thank you. Shake their hand, give them a pat on the back. And in the end, that's exactly what he did. And it made the world of difference to those people. And the difference in that little crew of people, my crew of guys, on Sunday morning, after Lewis had come on Saturday night to say thank you for the efforts after the crash in qualifying, was stark. People were refreshed. They were rejuvenated. They were passionate about what they were doing in a different way. They were happy. They had smiles on their face. They had energy again. And it came from just two simple words that Lewis had said to each one of them individually. Thank you. It was massive. And the same thing has applied to my friend after working with Sebastian Vettel in the last weeks. The word thank you has made an enormous difference. When somebody of power or influence, somebody of stature in your life takes a moment to say thank you and appreciate what you do, the feeling is incredible. The empowerment that it can give you is massive. And as with everything else we've been saying, when you get that empowering feeling, when you get that feeling of electricity running through your, your mind from a, in a positive sense, it can completely change the outcomes that come from your new behaviours. I remember, I forget which race it was, but I remember when I was working with Kimi Raikkonen, when Ron Dennis came into our garage after an absolute disaster in FP3, where Kimi had crashed the car, and all hands were on deck to get the car rebuilt in the hour or so that we had available before qualifying. And we threw this car together with such pace, with such vigor and determination to make sure that car was gonna make it out for qualifying. All hands on deck. We cut it so fine. And the car had its wheels bolted on, it had Kimmy sat in the car and I was strapping him in with the car still up in the air while the floor was being bolted on. There were parts being strapped onto that car all over it whilst the driver's getting in and we're starting to fire up the engine. The last bolts were being done up as the car was being lowered down onto the floor with its wheels on. And quite literally, the last screw went in as Kimmy screeched out of the garage and just made it out of the pit lane and got out for qualifying before the red light came on at the end of the pit lane and he missed his slot. It was a huge effort. It was a moment of celebration just to get into qualifying. And then Kimmy went and delivered a great lap. The first lap out with this brand new car of bits that were thrown all over it with half the number of screws holding the floor on that should have been there because we didn't have time to put them in. And yet Kimmy delivered an unbelievable lap. And in the absolute chaos that ensued with tools everywhere and stuff all over the garage, as the car left, everyone in that garage fist pumped each other, gave each other massive hugs just because we'd achieved what seemed impossible a few moments earlier. And as Kimmy delivered this astonishing lap, and I forget where he put the car on the grid, but it was a great result for all of us. 
In that moment, Ron Dennis walked over to our side of the garage and he said two words that lit up the entire team. He walked over as we were congratulating ourselves and he just said, well done. Well done, that's all he said. But because it had come from Ron Dennis, that was something that Ron never did. Ron never spoke to us on a personal level. He wasn't very good at doing that. But in that one moment when he did it, it had such an enormously positive impact. And I cannot even begin to quantify what that might have meant for all of us in that garage. I know for me, it made my chest puff out. It made me feel proud to be working for McLaren, to be wearing that uniform. I knew what we just achieved was phenomenal, but I also knew that the boss of the entire company had seen it and he'd appreciated it. And he'd taken the time to wander over and just say, well done, through gritted teeth, clenched fists. I felt like I wanted to give Ron an enormous hug in that moment. That was the level of the impact that those two words had on me and my colleagues. And so my message, what I'm saying to you, is don't ever underestimate how powerful those kind of things can be. If somebody around you has done something amazing, tell them, say it to them. Don't ever think that you don't need to say it. If you're the boss of a company, if you're the leader of a team, if you have people around you, colleagues in your office, and one of them does something well, tell them how good it is. Tell them what an achievement that can be. Because it's those little details, those little moments that become stepping stones that people can build from. And those little stepping stones of positivity climb a, a kind of ladder, they form a ladder that people can climb up towards the even bigger and greater successes. And if you don't get recognized, if you don't get an appreciation for those things that you've achieved that are brilliant on many occasions, if you get a lack of appreciation, that ladder stops forming. You stop climbing up towards the success that you or your team needs to achieve. So just finding a moment to say thank you or to say well done, to say congratulations, to give somebody a pat on the back, give them a fist pump, just go and tell them how well they've done can be such a powerful thing to do. It's easy, it doesn't cost you anything. A few seconds is all it takes, a tiny amount of effort, but the impact can be far reaching, way further than you might imagine. So say it to your children when they've done something well. Say it to your partner. Don't ever feel like, well, they know I appreciate them. They know that I appreciate what they do. I'm sure they do, but they still love to hear it. If you feel like you haven't got the time to go down and congratulate a team in the office, if you're the boss, maybe think again. Maybe make that time, because for the small amount of time that it takes, the return on that small investment of your time could be enormous. And also, if there's somebody around you that's done something great, just reach across the office, say well done, send them an email, send them a text message. These things can be way more powerful than you think. In the same way we talked about kindness last week, appreciation, appreciation of what somebody has done can go a long way to improving the long-term success that those people or the people around you might go on to achieve with your support. So look, that's it for this week, guys. Try and remember some of those things. Saying thank you and well done is easy. It's so easy to do, but so many of us just overlook it. We don't think it's important. We think or we assume people know it. Just maybe they don't, so say it. And the other thing, as I said earlier on, this idea of looking around you at the people that surround you in business or in life in general and trying to have an appreciation and an understanding of what they might need to thrive. And is that something that you can help give them? And if it is, that little bit of effort could go an awful long way to creating an environment in which they can get the best out of them because if they get the best out of them and they see the efforts you're willing to go to, that will come back to benefit you at some point. And the performance improvement that happens as a result of those small changes, 
Those small little details can be quite phenomenal. I witnessed it in my own life this weekend. I've seen it across the world of Formula One for many, many years, and I know the same little detail changes can benefit you and the people around you too. So give it a go. Thank you so much, guys, for listening again this week. As ever, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much again to Car Gods. And don't forget, if you do go to cargods.com, it's not too late to get yourself one of their wonderful advent calendars. And I cannot recommend that highly enough. Thank you to Car Gods. Thank you to you. Have a great week, whatever it is you're up to. And try and remember this as you go through the next seven days. Do the right things and do the things right.